to worship here online at University United Methodist Church in Austin, Texas. Whether this is your very first time worshiping with us or whether you worship with us every week, I want you to hear these words of affirmation and love. Whoever you are and wherever you happen to be on your faith journey or your life journey, you are welcome. I'm so glad you're here. At this time, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Hi, and thanks again for being in worship with us this day. My name is Teresa Wellborn, and I am the senior pastor here at University UMC. In today's service, we begin a new sermon series on creation care and climate justice. We know that this season after Easter is a time of new birth in nature as we see wildflowers and hear more bird songs. It is also a time when we will anticipate the celebration of Earth Day and we will remember our call to be good stewards of God's creation. In today's service, you will hear a couple of scripture passages that refer to fire and we will be thinking about fire and its meaning as a theme in our spiritual lives and also in the physical world. As we continue in worship, I want you to hear these words from the social principles of the United Methodist Church. It reads, All creation is the Lord's, and we are responsible for the ways in which we use and abuse it. Let us recognize the responsibility of the church and its members to place a high priority on changes in economic, political, social and technological lifestyles to support a more ecologically equitable and sustainable world, leading to a higher quality of life for all God's children. May it be so. And friends, at this time, let us join together in song as A.V. leads us.
friends, let us hear these words from James found in the New Testament. I'll be reading from chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will face stricter judgment. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is mature, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole body. Or look at ships, though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, yet they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of life, and it is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species, but no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless the Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes a blessing and a curse. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. This is the word of God for us, the people of God this day. Amen. Let us pray. God of love, we give you thanks this day and always for your holy and living word, its meaning in our lives today and forever. And we ask in these moments now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our strength and our salvation. Amen. So I trust and hope that all of you had meaningful experiences of viewing the eclipse earlier this week. I was in downtown Austin to view it, and even though it was a mostly cloudy, cloudy day, I thought it all lived up to the hype. I found it a meaningful moment, and I dare say even spiritual. I know many others felt the same. Being in nature, being caught up in an awe-inspiring moment is moving. NPR shared several videos of people throughout the country viewing the eclipse. And my favorite video was of nuns in Pennsylvania. They were completely captivated and they had this childlike delight in all that they were seeing. One of them named Sister Audrey kept saying, wow, oh, wow. And at one point, these sisters started singing hallelujah together. It makes all sorts of sense to me that time spent in creation connects us to the creator. For the last couple of years, we've here at UUMC had a post Easter sermon series centered in the theme of creation. One year we looked at topics like sky and trees. We learned how those themes show up in scripture and we considered their valuable lessons. Last year, we looked at animals in some of the iconic Bible stories like big fish and sheep. Well, as I spent some time this year reading and praying and visiting with staff about what we might do this year, I landed on creation care and climate justice. Caring for creation was our first task. The book of Genesis is clear with words reminding us that we as humans are to be stewards of the earth, but we have not been good stewards. Climate change indeed is a sobering topic. And as if things aren't dire enough, I will say that I settled on some specific themes that are quite heavy in nature. Fires and floods, we're seeing more of both of those in the world. We'll also be looking later in the month at climate migration and famine, all due to climate change. You know, it's true. It's true that these sermon topics won't be found on any list of the most lighthearted and feel-good things to talk about in church. But I know you as a congregation, 
You can do hard things. You can and you do engage in hard conversations. And because we follow the way of Jesus, because we care about the gift of creation that we are a part of, because we care about the future that we will be leaving behind for those who come after us, because of all this, we will engage in the topic of climate change. And we might even be surprised along the way by some good news and hope. So first, fire. We know, we know that fire has a lovely sentimental quality. I consider at our in-person sanctuary, the glow of prayer candles during worship. I've seen more of those of late. And as you worship at home or in your places of travel, some of you might have a candle lit nearby. Or consider a fire warming you in a winter cabin. Fire can be gift indeed. And fire can also be dangerous. One of the most vivid experiences I have of fire being almost dangerous was when I was serving in my very first appointment as a pastor. I was living in the small rural town of Smiley, Texas in Gonzales County. In that place, there's only one traffic light in town, and it's a blinking one at that. Most of the church members were chicken farmers or cattle ranchers, and I was the only full-time pastor in town. I lived in the parsonage just yards away from the church. One day, I was walking from the parsonage to the church office when I saw a few flames in the yard. It took time for me to register what I was seeing. It was the dead of summer. We were in the middle of a drought. The land was dry and the grass was brittle. It was hot. Just as I was grasping what was going on, a church member just happened to be driving by. He quickly hopped out of his truck, lifted large pedals out of the back of it, a tool that was specifically designed to smash the flames out. That experience has always stayed with me and is, it is so vivid in my mind. To this day, I wonder what would have happened if he didn't happen to be driving by at that moment. Fire is gift, yes, and fire can be destructive. This is true in the physical world, and it is also true in our spiritual lives, in the spiritual realm. The reading from the book of James this morning underscores this point. Specifically, he says that the tongue is a fire. On the one hand, we have the power of prophetic speech that is bold and at times even scathing in its critique. It makes me think of Jesus overturning the tables of the money changers but the tongue as a fire can become problematic when that fiery speech ceases to be prophetic and only serves to destroy. No longer is it building up, it's only tearing down. In many schools today, children are taught principles of speech that I first learned from a Buddhist writer, and it goes like this. Before you speak, ask yourself, is it kind? Is it true? Is it necessary? This is good advice and things that I wish I remembered every time I opened my mouth. Things I wish everyone on social media would remember, right? How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire and the tongue is a fire. For someone whose work is centered in language and speech, James has some challenging words for me because I'm often speaking I'm preaching, I'm writing, I'm saying some things. And on top of all that, I'm an external processor. I often sometimes know what I think by saying it out loud. But how can we encourage one another to be good stewards of our speech, to consider thoughtfully the words that we use? Are they true? Are they kind? Are they necessary? How can we challenge ourselves to avoid using words that harm? especially at this time in the life of our country when we see Christian nationalism and white supremacy going hand in hand, how can we do good and do no harm? At times it will be speaking up and speaking against, but at other times it will be speaking less. I consider, especially for those of us who are white, who are often eager at times to take an overly defensive posture and stance, explaining why we are different than those other guys. Well, at those times, it might be just as important to be silent 
and to let our actions and our love speak and to allow others to elevate their voice. One of my favorite quotes about fire and religion comes from the late rabbi, Jonathan Sachs. He died in recent years, but he's an award-winning author and respected moral voice. It was in 2016 that he was awarded the Templeton Prize in recognition of his exceptional contributions to affirming life's spiritual dimension. This is what he says about fire and religion. He says, religion is not what the European Enlightenment thought it would become, mute, marginal, and mild. It is a fire, and like fire, it warms, but it also burns, and we are the guardians of the flame. He goes on to say, in other words, religion is an incredible power, and anything, anything with that kind of power can be a force for good, and it can also be a force for evil. In a similar way, fire can have both positive and negative qualities in the physical world. We know that well. Fire is a natural phenomenon that serves important ecological purposes. It clears dead and diseased plants from the forest. It even helps some plants thrive and reproduce. But like speech, it can also have a harmful impact. A warming planet is contributing to devastating wildfires. Here's some of what I've learned. Hot and dry conditions are exacerbating wildfires, causing an increased number of uncontrolled disastrous wildfires. We consider, for example, the recent Smokehouse Creek fire here in our own state earlier this year. While it is true that an electric wire caused the start of the fire, experts in the field are also telling us that wildfire risks are heightened due to a trio of weather conditions all caused by climate change, including high temperatures, low humidity, and strong winds. The average, the average wildfire season in the United States, in the Western United States, is now over three months longer than it was decades ago. As one meteorologist has said, there were clear fire seasons for Texas in the past, but fires have become a year long threat. Where is the word of hope in all of this, we might ask? Well, I don't think any of us as individuals can completely reverse all the effects of climate change in the whole world. Now, some might call me a pessimist for saying such a thing, but I think I'm a pragmatist. And more and more, I find that I am called to do all I can in my corner of the world affect change where and how I can. You've done just that in raising funds for United Methodist Committee on Relief in response to the Texas wildfires recently. We use our words for good by advocating for policies that are centered in creation care. We use our voice for good by protesting, talking to politicians who can affect change, and of course, by voting. We can also spend time outside to stand in awe at the beauty of creation. Awe, I believe, is the gateway to love, and love leads to truly caring. I want to leave you with these words from the journalist Connie Schultz. Connie watched the eclipse with her husband earlier this week, and she wrote these words. She said, I did not expect to be this moved, but as my husband and I stood there looking up at the sky, it was impossible not to think of the millions of others, humans, who stopped to lift their gaze along with us. We are all such small specks in the universe, but we are capable of big things in our limited time here. Look how curious we are, so open to discovery. We are the people who want to look up. I'm going to hold on to that memory now and call it hope. Amen. Friends, as we turn to a time of prayer, um, I do pray for all of us that we would um, seek to be people of not fear, but hope as we look to the future, even in what seems to be scary times as we face the realities of climate justice. May we, instead of looking to fear, look to hope in seeing the small ways that we can make a difference right where we live. I want to also lift up prayers for our church community, especially those persons who are recovering from surgery or are not feeling well this day. 
We pray for the lonely and those who are living with anxiety and depression. We pray for our wider community, especially the University of Texas students and our unhoused neighbors. I'm grateful again that you are here and remind you as always that if you are going through something, a pastoral care need, and you just want a listening ear, please don't hesitate to reach out to me or to Megan or Pastor Earl. Those are our, our pastoral care staff and um, you can find our contact information on our website and we'd be delighted to visit with you. As we go together to God in prayer, we do so with the trust that God hears the prayers of our heart. May we pray. Abba Father, we pray for those affected by the wildfires throughout the Western United States and Texas. We pray that your mercy would be upon them, keeping them safe from harm. We pray for those in affected areas, for their loved ones, for neighbors, friends, pets, and livestock. We pray for persons in future fires that they would be able to escape the flames, the smoke, and devastation. We pray for homes and businesses and places of worship. We pray for those whose health is threatened by the smoke and ash when there is a fire. We pray that you would ease their suffering and protect them from permanent damage. We pray, O oh God, for firefighters, giving thanks for them and for first responders. We pray, O oh God, that you would meet their needs, shield them from harm, lift their weariness, and send them relief. We pray, O oh God, for wildlife and old growth in the path of flames. We pray that you would grant them the means of escape and prevent irreversible harm. We pray for those who have already lost homes and jobs and treasured possessions. We pray for those persons who hear of wildfires and are reminded of experiences that they've had from the past. We pray that you would comfort and sustain them and restore all they've lost. We pray for the displaced and the discouraged that their spirits would be lifted and they would be restored to hope. We pray for all who are stressed, anxious, and fearfully following the news that you would pour out a healing and calming balm. God, grant that the flames and smoke may be turned back and away and dangers and damages miraculously limited by your strong hand. And Lord, when these fiery trials have ceased, renew lives, renew families, communities, and environments in the ways that only you can. In you, O oh God, we place our trust. In you alone, we wait and we hope. Thanks be to God. Amen and amen. Touch the earth lightly, use the earth gently, nourish the life of the world in our care. Gift of great wonder, ours to surrender, trust for the children to
At this time in worship, we come to a time of offering. And if you feel led to give financially to the work of Christ here at University UMC, we invite you to go to the donate button on our website and there you will find ways to give. We thank you for your financial generosity that enables us to be a place of unconditional love and justice in action here in the heart of Austin. One of the ways that we seek to deepen our practices of justice and peace is by doing all that we can to take care of God's good earth. Here at our in-person campus, we have recycling bins and compost bins, and we look forward to learning more about how we can be better stewards of God's creation. I also wanna let you know that because of your generosity, we're able to have wonderful Lunch and Learn series. Next Sunday, in worship at our in-person service, Reverend Dr. Becca Edwards will be joining us, and then after worship in the fellowship hall, all are invited to join a lunch and learn opportunity with her. Her passion and clim is climate justice, and she's a deacon candidate in the United Methodist Church. Becca is a friend and a colleague of mine, and I know that you will be blessed as she shares about her passion, blending and weaving together her love for the church, her love for God's people, and her passion for climate justice. And now friends, as you go forth this day, I wanna leave you with these words from the prophet Isaiah, reading from chapter 43. And now thus says God, he who created you, O Israel, he who formed you, O Jacob, do not fear, for I have redeemed you and I have called you by name. You are mine. And when you pass through the waters, I will be with you and through the rivers they shall not overwhelm you. And when you walk with fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame, it will not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba, in exchange for you, because you are precious in my sight. You are honored, and I love you. I give people in return for you, nations in exchange for your life, do not fear, for I am with you, says God. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>